Hello, my name is Paul Kanyuk, and I'm picking up with the procedural shading of a city demo in Katana for Renderman. This is part three, and um, let's uh, get started where we left off. Now, I'd like to start by apologizing for the quality of the last demo. Apparently, we had a lot of audio dropouts. The audio got about 50 seconds out of sync by the end of it, but, um, you know, I'm going to... I just got to move on. I don't have a lot of time to make these demos, so it is what it is. Bigger thing I need to apologize for is um, it turns out last demo we weren't actually using baked shading. And I'll show you what I mean by that. We were actually running our um, occlusion and curvature signals live as opposed to reading the baked te textures, which was a big performance hit, which made that demo even slower which also pegged the processor causing more audio dropouts. So to show you what I mean by that, let's go to our PRMan global settings and let's just do a quick uh, four sample render just to get some timing info. I'm going to set samples to four and let's kick off a render and let's see how long that takes. Then I will correctly enable our baked occlusion or curvature and then we'll compare what the implication on performance is. So let's go ahead and create a monitor and uh, see our render come in. Note, the other thing I'm doing for this demo is um, changing my interactive uh, 2D and 3D threads to 7 as opposed to 8. I'm thinking some of the audio dropouts from my previous demos were due to using all processors for rendering. So while a live renderer was going, um, the screen recording software was getting a little stressed out. So hopefully this is uh, addressed, this demo right here. Anyway, we're getting close to finishing that. and. Um, We'll take a look at the time, and this is about the performance we were seeing uh, last demo. And that's uh, 50 seconds for four samples. Now, the reason why the uh, bake shading wasn't working is if we go back to our bake network, recall that we strategically used a material assign to assign our bake shader at the poly mesh level, and then use an op script that would run in deferred mode on every poly mesh and change the input to that shader to pick up the baked texture. I was sloppy and I did not include this op script uh, here in our render branch. So that's pretty sloppy. Uh, what I did, I thought I was going to cleverly, oh, let me just, um, you know, use this uh, material assigned def and just throw our facade shader in it and everything will just work. No, that's not going to work. Like the bake shader, we need to assign at the leaf poly mesh level. Um, otherwise, this uh, op script has no parameters to set. So that was a big, big mistake right there. Go back to uh, my to part one of this demo if you're not sure what I'm talking about here. This is where I go over how to make sure that we can get a different name texture per poly mesh, and we need to do the same thing for reading a different texture per poly mesh. Now to make double sure that we really aren't using uh, the live occlusion and curvature, I'm actually going to disconnect these right now. You shouldn't have to do that. Sorry, um, that's how you disconnect. You shouldn't have to do this. Um, it should just work, but I just want to prove to you that we really are reading the baked occlusion and curvature. So I am uh, dramatically disconnecting it. And let's see if we get an identical looking image and let's also compare the render time. So let's go ahead and kick that off. It's worth noting, um, this is a RenderMan, I think 21.4 and the similar version of RenderMan for Katana. Um, I should mention this at the beginning of every demo because I just came back from SIGGRAPH and there's some great new technology coming with RenderMan 21.5 and 22 that is not included in this that should make the live render much faster, much more responsive. So um, please do not judge the current state of the software necessarily by these demos. This is just a, a demo I'm doing at one point in time. Hopefully the lessons about baking and proceduralism still hold, even if the details of live rendering and the rendering tech continue to evolve. All right, so now, moment of truth. Did we save any time? We saved six seconds. Okay, that wasn't as dramatic as I thought, but really we are reading baked textures, and in the long run, this is going to um, dramatically increase the render time um, overall. If we had l used higher samples in our occlusion and curvature, this spread would have been uh, much different. And also there's going to be less noise because uh, the pattern is going to be more converged because, um, in fact, let's see if that's true. 
Now it's definitely different, um, but I'm hoping that there's less noise as well because the pattern is not going to have uh, ray tracing in it. Anyway, so this is pretty much where we should have left off in part three. Where I want to take it from here is quickly show how to use Primvars to set the paint color on our material. And I'm actually not going to go into lighting. I have some other demos that cover that, so I'm just going to show you the end result because I've been droning on long enough. But right now we pretty much have the same material on everything. It'd be nice if we can vary up the color on different buildings without necessarily changing the material. One way to do that is using a prim bar. So let's go ahead and find where to even set the color of our paint. Here's our paint material. And hit E right there to edit it. Then in diffuse we have a color parameter. If we were to create a PR man shading node, set the node type to prim var. Um, this is a node that can grab a color or float or whatever from whatever geometry the shader is assigned to and read that as part of the network. Um, note that there's only a certain number of data types this work with. Uh, string is not one of them, which is why we did the whole op script in deferred mode with material assigned at the leaf level to set uh, a file, the texture need to be different because we do not have string primvars. But for every other data type, the primvar is the most elegant and fast way to do this kind of uh, kind of thing. So I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it as a float. And actually, no, I'm going to make this a color because we want to set paint color. And I'm going to call this PSM paint color primbar. Hooray. Then I, we're going to have to give it a name. I'm going to just call it paint color. Uh, so that's going to be the variable name it's going to look for. And I'm going to connect the result to RGB to the diffuse color. That is lovely, um, but uh, right now if we set this, we'll probably get black everywhere because this uh, variable is not being fine. We actually found we actually have to set this primvar on every poly mesh. So let's go to where we bring in the city, maybe right here, and add an attribute set node. I'm gonna call this. Uh, I'm gonna set it to cell, and I'm gonna call this as set default paint color um, and what we need to do is basically uh, let's dig down here into our city find a mesh uh, we need to set uh, these primvar attributes which are under geometry arbitrary note we already have one primvar and that's ST which is our UV coordinates but we're going to need to set um, you know more of these uh, we're going to set one called paint color and anything basically under geometry arbitrary will wind up in the rib stream and the shader will pick it up. So I'm going to create a new attribute called geometry.arbitrary.paintcolor. Um, oh, and uh, we need to give it a cell. Um, I'm actually, what I'm going to do is basically pick up all poly meshes under the city. Um, I've done this before. Um, we're going to want to set the paint color differently on every poly mesh potentially, so I'm just going to set it there. So I'm going to add a custom cell statement, and I'm just going to drag in city, and do slash slash star uh, to pick up every leaf node under city. Um, and then I'm going to do where type equals poly mesh. And hopefully that will give us a paint color uh, under here. And there we go. So we have a paint color float attribute, but unfortunately it's not enough just to set an attribute. Um, Primvars can apply at many different resolutions. Um, they can be set per vertex. They can be set per face. They can be set uh, as a uniform or constant for the entire mesh. Um, so we need to make sure we um, supply this info. The way that's done is rather than having a simply setting a double we are going to set a group and a group is basically a collection of attributes uh, each of which can specify something about this primvar. So I'm going to add one a string and I'm going to call this um, scope uh, rename parameter and I'm going to call this primitive then I'm going to add another, uh, a uh, color, an RGB, 
and I'm going to call this uh, value. And in theory, let's say we pick some color, maybe this something reddish. This will now be the paint color for every um, for all the buildings. And this is just maybe going to be the default. We're going to want to set it differently per building. But for now, let's just uh, do that and see what we get. So preview render. Drag one in. And hopefully we get some red buildings. Hooray, that worked. Um, and the brick stays the same color. This is just the color of the paint. All right, so that's nice, but we want to um, actually set this differently for per building. So I'm going to stop that render. Let's pick maybe a better default color. I think uh, something closer to uh, let's maybe just desaturate that, like a middle gray would be fine. Uh, but we're going to want to potentially set these uh, for every building right here. Um, so a few ways we can do this. Um, one is we literally can just copy and paste this attribute set a whole bunch of times and we refine the cell expression but we end up getting a lot of nodes and I want to quickly show you guys how to create a group stack a group stack is a way of just collecting a bunch of nodes that are doing roughly the same thing in one place so just to organize your node graph a little better um, and to populate that I'm just gonna copy that default basically select control C that default paint color attribute set then right click paste into the group stack. I'm going to call this one a set of default paint color. Um, I'll just call it set PC building 01. And for the uh, for what it's going to do, I'm going to just um, update the uh, cell expression to refer to that path and I'm just going to copy paste so that rather than starting at the city um, it digs down to building one unless that's the attribute there and I'm gonna very simply say building one you're going to be maybe bluish saturate that a little more great and you see where we're going with this I'm gonna you know I don't know which building is which I'm just gonna do a couple of these otherwise you're gonna go insane watching me do the same thing over and over and over again so um, I'm going to expand branch to the assembly level. All right, so that's building one. Great, let's find building two. What's this building? Building 12, all right. So I'm gonna set building one and building 12, and then you guys can imagine what the rest will look like. So I'm going to copy and paste, call this one building 12 find the cell expression from 01 to 12 and let's give it a different color maybe greenish keep it saturated uh, actually now the dirt is a little bit greenish uh, maybe I'll put this more on the yellow side cool all right so now we should have two different buildings with uh, different colors than the than the basic one so I'm gonna right click go to preview render drag that under and see what this looks like Hooray, so now we have a yellowish building, a blue building, and gray buildings. And this is one of the ways using Primbars that we can vary shader parameters um, per object, is just using float and color Primbars um, just to set these attributes. And this is actually a way we shade at Quixar, Quixar at Pixar quite a bit. Um, we try to use fewer shaders but with uh, more information being passed by Primvar. This allows randomization of parameters per building or object, and you get a lot more reuse out of your shaders this way. All right, um, to finish this demo, you know, we can go a lot further, but I'm actually getting really tired of this demo. Um, I might, I could do more if people really want, but this is where we're going. When I was prepping for this, um, I think I'll be posting this on YouTube as well. Um, this is where I pretty much took the shader a little further. This is a high sample. I think this might be a 256 sample per frame render. I used Primvars to set the material differently per building. Added a window shader. I did a little bit of, um, this is the Grace Cathedral light probe for an environment light. And I put a uh, disc light uh, per lamp post uh, with a shaper to go down. And yeah, this is pretty much how we would flesh out this material. Note. There are only three shaders in this scene right here. One for the building, one for the window, 
Actually, I take it back. There are only two shaders, one for the building and one for the window. Uh, and maybe a metal shader for the light post. So just three. And then, yes, I was very heavy-handed with the bloom and compositing, but that's a way to make things look better. Anyway, I just wanted this to be a quick demo. Um, let me know if there's any more stuff you want to see from Katana, but um, now that I'm done with teaching my class at the Film Academy, I'm probably going to take a break from doing Katana demos for a while and get back to work. Um, but uh, for now, yeah, um, hope you guys enjoyed, and I'm looking forward to seeing uh, RenderMan 22 in action. That SIGGRAPH demo was awesome. All right, see you guys later. Bye.